AI will not replace physicians, but it will replace physicians mm. without AI. In other words, if AI is oh, available... Yeah. Hey, welcome back to Emphasis Tech Talks, the podcast for business leaders leveraging technology to raise their bottom lines. I'm your host, David Clausen of Emphasis Tech. Our guest today is Paul Masteridis, the CEO at Adherum. Paul has some great ideas on how AI will improve patient outcomes and quality of life. And stick around so you don't miss out on his sound advice to keep highly talented people uh, actively engaged. This episode has a lot to unpack. Be sure to like and subscribe to make sure you get notified of future videos when they're released. Well, thanks, Paul. Appreciate you joining us today. Uh, let's just jump right into it. I'm curious. So what's new in the respiratory digital device space? <laughs> well, yeah, thank you. It's, uh, I'm glad to be here, David. Um, uh, I'm excited to talk about this because I've been doing this for 27 years. So it's kind of my passion uh, to do this. Um, uh, just a just a little bit of background, if I can, um, uh, and why I'm talking about asthma and COPD. Uh, I've been doing this in the pharmaceutical industry for, for 27 years, and uh, both clinical trials, development, medical affairs, uh, really taking the drugs that we've produced, got FDA approved or approved in the European Union, and then giving it to patients. But what happens with the patients is um, when you have these chronic diseases, right, like asthma and COPD, there's no cure. The only cure uh, is taking your medication as prescribed, and that'll reduce these asthma attacks or what we call uh, uh, breathing attacks that you have with both of these diseases that are long-term. And so for us, it's important that people take it as prescribed, but so many people out there aren't doing it, right? They forget, they get busy with their work, Sometimes they feel better and they're like, well, why do I need to take it? I'm feeling good. But in this case, it's when you, when you don't take it that bad things start to happen with you and then you can't breathe and then you'll go to the emergency room or you get hospitalized. And every day about 10 people uh, die of asthma and about 40 people die of COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And uh, a lot of these people don't need to die, right? Uh, if we can help them, if we can encourage them to take their medication. And there's two things that happen. It's not just taking your inhalers, because that's what most people are doing, right? There's They start out, doctors start out with the, these kind of things, right? These kind of inhalers uh, that they, they start out with. Um, a lot of people don't know how to take them. And so technique, technique is very important. You know, do do I inhale? Do I press the button and then inhale? How long do I inhale? Do I shake the, the canister? There's so many things involved uh, in that. And so what ends up happening is people aren't getting the proper training. They're not taking their medication the way they should, and they're not taking it as often, right? They forget. And so here at Ethereum, what we've done is we came up with these really nifty uh, devices right here that fits that fits these canisters. And these devices are probably the most sophisticated or technologically advanced devices. There's about five sensors in there. And it senses when you have the device attached. It can sense if you're shaking, how often you're shaking the bottle. It, it can sense if you're inhaling it and if you're pressing the button to release the drug into your lungs. So a lot of sensors in there that really give an insight to how that person is taking it. And in the U.S. right now, um, we get paid for monitoring these patients on a continual basis called reimbursement, uh, uh, remote patient care monitoring, right, of these asthma or COPD patients. So we're, we're now starting, this has been a couple of months, we're now in the U.S., we're growing here. And uh, we're introducing our Haley devices to physicians, to hospital systems, uh, to large practices. And uh, we're, we're monitoring those patients on behalf of the physician to make sure their technique is right and to make sure they're, uh, they take it the way they're, they're supposed to do it. 
Wow, Paul, that's all exciting stuff. Um, in that I know that that's a challenge for a number of people, and it sounds like you're doing good work there to uh, to help them uh, uh, make sure that you know they get the help that they need. So, talk to me about a little bit about the technology behind the scenes, and uh, so how are you getting that data? How's that data being transported back? Uh, for your ability to be able to monitor those systems. Right. So um, we have um, obviously a, a group of engineers, a group of programmers uh, that, that are helping us with all this uh, data collection because it's all about the data, right? What do we do with this data that we capture from, uh, from the patients? Um, how do we use the data to help them with their technique? How do we use the data to share the information with their physicians when they go see them, you know, once every six months or three months, how often they go, it would be great for the, their physician to say, oh, I see you've been taking this medication or you're not taking this medication or here's where we need to, to work on. And so, uh, like I mentioned before, we have over five different sensors that are attached onto this that gives us the data. Uh, that data is uh, the our device, our Haley device, is paired with the person's smartphone, or in some cases, we have a hub that uh, comes in if you don't have a smartphone, a hub. That hub then, or that smartphone, will give the patient information, right, on their phone, and that data is sent is sent into to our team of respiratory therapists that can view it on a platform uh, and, and look at how all their patients are, are doing. That's monitored every day. And then uh, depending, we, we kind of color code things so we make it easier. If you're in the green, you're good to go. If you're yellow or red, you'll probably get a call from us and uh, we'll help you with your technique or we're, we're reminded you to take your, your medication. And then uh, once a month, we provide a report to the physician and that's stored in their electronic medical record system. So whenever they see that patient, they at least have an ongoing report of how that patient is doing. Good, good. And um, so you said you said earlier about coming into the U.S. So is this already um, rolled out in Europe? Then is that the case, or where else are you um, deployed right now? Other than in America? Yeah, right now our headquarters is in Melbourne, Australia. Our R and D is in Auckland, New Zealand. Our manufacturing is in uh, Hana Microelectronics in Thailand. And so, for us, for years, we've been a company that worked with pharmaceutical companies like AstraZeneca and GSK with their respiratory devices in clinical trials. And so, for them. Um, they would help us create these devices. Uh, we would develop them. We would create them for their products. And that's why right now we've been in business for about 17 years. We have 15 FDA cleared devices because they're not all the same, right? Every company has different sizes, shapes. Uh, uh, some are powder. Some are uh, meter dose uh, uh, inhalation systems. So we have a device pretty much for about 80% of the inhalers out on the market. Uh, and so that gives us a broad range. Whatever the physician wants to prescribe, we pretty much have a Haley device, uh, you know, for it. And so we were doing these clinical trials. We had these devices. Uh, and what ended up happening is, you know, clinical trials take about a year or two, sometimes three years to finish. And so for us to be able to sustain, to sustain a good business, uh, you either, ha either have to have a lot of clinical trials going on or you have to branch out into new areas. And that's what we're doing. This is uh, reimbursement in the U.S. has been about a couple years old. And so um, when they hired me back in February as their new CEO, I said, I'm taking the business to the U.S. We're going to grow here. We're going to partner with allergists, we're gonna partner with hospital systems, we're gonna partner with healthcare systems, and uh, we're gonna monitor those patients and make sure we collect that data to show the value that, that we bring. And in the way, in, in, in turn, we would get, uh, we would charge a fee, we have a subscription fee, if you will, on a monthly basis, and then the reimbursement that we were able to collect would go 
uh, to the physician uh, on, on behalf of the physician. So that's kind of the new model that we're doing now in the in the U.S. Where uh, we still have a few clinical trials, you know, going on, but now we kind of shifted, kind of 180 degree shift from a clinical trial company to a commercial company now uh, out there monitoring these patients and uh, providing the value to to the patients and to the physicians. Okay. Yeah. And so um, I'm just thinking, so being a data guy, by the way, I like using the tag. Uh, it's all about the data. Yes. That's, That's my right. tag on LinkedIn, right? Oh, is it? So, uh, <laughs> okay, great. Uh, pre- yeah, yeah. Yeah, appreciate you using that tag. Um, <laughs> but it really, I mean, in most applications, that's the case. It's yes. about the data. And in this case, it is too. So my assumption is that you're collecting the data on each dose, right? And then you're measuring the intervals between those along with some of the other metrics that you're collecting based on your sensors and so forth. Um, is Give me a little bit of an idea of the scale and uh, about about how many patients are we talking about and how many how many times I don't know uh, not having used the inhaler like that what what's the normal uh, cycle there I mean is that once a day three times a day what tell me what that looks like yeah so um, in in our lifetime we probably have given over 160,000 devices to to patients and um both in clinical yeah in clinical trials and uh um in uh, in the real world if you will um yeah i think it's uh it's it's very important uh the data that you get the data helps us not only you know we can see hey for example you're you're supposed to shake the canister if it's a meter dose inhaler for about 5 seconds Right. You want to, you want to be able to mix the gas with the drug and get, get a nice even mix. So you're ready to inhale. So we monitor that. You, you want to be able to start breathing in as you're pressing the canister. Right. So you can get that nice airflow coming in. You press the canister and you want to breathe in if you can as hard and as quick as you can. So we measure peak inhalation. And then we, we want you to, after you've inhaled it, we want you to close your mouth and count to five and make sure all that drug is getting in. So now we've got what we call the volume or the inhalation duration. So all that data is captured. And what that will help us do is not only uh, find out where that patient needs work, and we can spot the different areas that patient needs work for their technique to make sure they get it right. Uh, but there are reminders, you know, because people forget these things beep. They're a little bit annoying, but they beep and it's good. I mean, I, I have mine for, for a demo and I have it in the dining room and I'm in the family room and this thing is beeping at 10 o'clock because I have it for 10 a.m. and 10 p.m. And uh, oh, I can hear the, the beeper going on. This is good because when you when you're on a busy day and you you forget most of these patients have to take it twice a day, which we call maintenance therapy, right? Uh, and some of these inhalers have one drug in them, some have two drugs, some have three drugs with various strengths, and depending on how severe their disease is, right, their asthma or their COPD, and so they'll they'll take it twice a day. So we monitor them to make sure. Are they taking it twice a day? How often they're taking it? Uh, we, we, we give also reinforcement to the patient. The patient can see uh, as well. But they also take a rescue medication. And what is that? That is another device, another inhaler, that is a as-needed prescribed, right? You take it when you need it. Uh, the, the maintenance you're going to take twice a day. But let's say you went up a stairs and you're feeling a little shortness of breath. You can use your rescue inhaler and take a couple of puffs at that point. We monitor the rescue inhalers too, because why is that important? We have found out that people don't take their medication twice a day, sometimes once a day, sometimes they skip a day. 
But they'll have their rescue inhaler and they might use that a lot quicker because they get relief faster, if that makes any sense, right? And so they'll, they'll take that. Uh, and sometimes we have found if somebody has taken it three, four, five times a day, they're on a verge of getting an asthma attack. If you get an asthma attack, you got to get hospitalized. You got to go see a doctor or you got to uh, go to the emergency room because you can't breathe. You hard to breathe. And so all those things we capture. Now think about the data that we have. We'll be able to take this data through AI and predict when someone will have an exacerbation attack. We call it exacerbation attacks as an asthma attack three to five days before they occur. And at that point, we can, yeah, we can get them to the doctor's office, get them treated appropriately before they have a full-blown attack and need to be hospitalized. And so we have a, a study from the Cleveland Clinic. You've heard of the Cleveland Clinic, big, big hospital systems. Yeah, they use these adherence devices. They put it on COPD patients and they followed those patients and they, they saw that people who were being monitored on these devices had a 35% reduction in hospitalizations. That's huge. That's one out of every three. And a hospitalization can, can run you fifteen, twenty thousand dollars, depending how severe that is. Um, and so this is the benefit. I gotta think the insurance companies would be. Well, exactly. I gotta think the insurance companies would be all over that. They, right? they, they are. Yeah. yeah. This is, this is what, uh, the value that, that we can bring, right? We, we reduce the cost of the healthcare system. Plus, who wants to be in the hospital anyways? The patients don't want that. Uh, if you, if you have a patient that had an asthma attack and went hospitalized, I can tell you they don't want to go back again. And so be, being able, being able to, uh, to help them to say, Hey, we're going to, we're going to prescribe this. Your doctor prescribed this. We think you need it. We're going to monitor you. And our goal is to make sure you're breathing better. You got good technique and we want to keep you out of the hospital so you can live your life and have a good time. And that's, that's really what it's all about. Obviously you've got some, you have some really smart folks, uh, working for you and helping with, uh, you know, the design and the implementation of those sensors, and that data collection process and so forth. Um, is so do you have team members in all of those locations you were, you described earlier, Australia, Taiwan, etc. And tell me about working with a dis disparate group like that from different cultures and different parts of the world, time zones and so forth. Yeah, the, the time zones can be a little bit difficult because they're about 13, 14 hours different. So uh, my when I want to talk to Australia or New Zealand, it's going to be five o'clock, six o'clock, seven o'clock, eight o'clock at night. That's when I get uh, when I'll get to talk to them for my U.S. team. I'll talk to them in the morning. Uh, and the same with, um, uh, with the team in, uh, in the UK or, or in Europe. So it all depends, you know, where they're located. But the people who designed and developed these are out of Australia, or, or I'm sorry, uh, Auckland, New Zealand. And so that's really where the R and D is, um, where they get the different sensors. They put this together. They test them. Uh, we, we, you know, we, we'll go through proper user acceptance testing. We'll go through proper uh, uh, testing that needs to be done to get this ready. Obviously, we'll get it cleared by the FDA or European Union. And then we start um, manufacturing these. And we manufacture them. It, I call it HANA microelectronics. They're, they're a, in Thailand, and they're in, on the Thailand Stock Exchange. Uh, I went there about a few months ago to, to meet the group at HANA. Great group. Very impressed. Uh, we saw uh, uh, Apple uses them. Hewlett Packard uses them. Samsung uses them. I mean, this is a top-notch organization uh, uh, there. And when, when I saw how they assemble our devices and how many people were there to assemble our devices. And then they go through rigorous testing. Each sensor is tested. 
to make sure it's working. And then once the quality assurance, and by the way, it's not quality assurance like 10% of the products. It's 100% of the products. Every device, every Haley device is, is tested. And then, and only then, is it packaged and then sent sent to us. Yeah, that's that's an impressive rate of uh, Q&A or uh, doing the QA there. That's, that's pretty impressive. So, um, you know, thinking about those teams, what's, what's maybe some ideas you can give to our audience about how to manage uh, teams with, you know, really smart folks on it like that and, um, and keep them engaged uh, and, uh, you know, challenging them to keep, you know, to keep them uh, interested in what you're doing, right? Right. Yeah, I, I think the, the key is if Apple started, stopped at version one of their iPhone, they'd be out of business, right? And they're already on version 15. So they're always getting their teams to, to constantly come up with new things, better things. What, we, what, what does the customers out there need? And that's the same with us as well. I mean, our devices uh, have evolved, right? They have evolved from just time date stamping to now it beeps to now you can measure flow rate. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you this. It's kind of funny, David. It's kind of funny. A lot of patients, when they go visit their doctor, um, they, they want to please their doctor. So they don't want to go in with a canister that's full. So they'll take the canister and, and, and press it many times to, to reduce the volume, even though they didn't take the medication. And we have documented evidence of this, right? And so they go, they go to the doctor and they'll say, yeah, I, you know, I'm, I'm taking, yeah, I'm taking this and, you know, just to show the doctor they're, they're taking, but they're not taking it. Well, with our device, they, they can't do that anymore. With competitor devices, they still can. But with ours, they can't because you have to literally inhale it. And we need to see an airflow because we have an airflow sensor built in. If you don't inhale and we don't have a positive inhalation flow, you don't get credit for pressing the button that you've taken the drug. And so... And so, you know, this is, this is where it's gotten. So our team is very excited. Yeah. Our team is very excited to, uh, come up with what are we going to do next? Right. What are we going to add here? What are we going to do from a software perspective? How are we going to enhance our app? So we'll get a group of patients and we'll talk to them in kind of an advisory board. And we'll say to those patients, what would you like to see in your app? What's working? What's not working? What additional things would you like to see? So we go to our customers and then our customer says, wow, it'd be great if you had um, uh, air quality built in. You know, if I go outside, I'd like to see how the quality uh, is of the air, because I know if it's really bad air quality, um, uh, I, I can't breathe. And this, my, my mother is an asthmatic and what happened, we were out on the porch one day. This was last year. I don't know if you remember, there were some fires going on in Canada. And that smoke pretty much covered uh, New Jersey. And I couldn't feel it because I'm not an asthmatic. But my mother out on the porch, she felt it. She started coughing. And she says, oh, I don't feel good. I, don't, I can't breathe. There's something going on out here. I look at my air quality device and the air quality says it's in the red, really bad uh, 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 quality. And I said, mom, you got to go in, go back in the house. Uh, this isn't safe for you to be out here. And so she went in and, uh, you know, started breathing some good air and, 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 and revive. But these are the kind of things we want to bring to patients. And so to get our, our guys excited, to get our guys, you know, working, we're constantly thinking about ways to improve not only the hardware, but also the software as well. How do we improve it? And that's how we engage them. And then many times these tech guys are in labs. They don't get to see the patients, right? And so I'll videotape a patient. I'll show them the benefit of what they did, of what they produced. And then we have monthly town hall meetings. And I'll say, let me show you what you guys are doing. 
This is the value you bring. And I have Mrs. Johnson here who's been an asthmatic for many, many years. She couldn't breathe well. And now we're helping her with technique and we're reminding her. And here's what she has to say. And she's like, I can breathe better. I can walk better. I love these reminders. It's really saved my life. So they, they, you know, they kind of see what we see because we're, we're out here in the trenches. We'll go to the doctor's offices. We're talking to customers, but those people, they're not right. So that's how I bring the value of what they're doing um, to them so they can see the benefit. So that's, uh, that's awesome that you've tapped into that. I can tell you, uh, having worked in the IT industry for many years, uh, I've worked more than one role where it did feel like, you know, we were just the guys sitting in the corner behind the screen or whatever, and we did not see all of that value. Uh, and you're spot on that if, uh, when the tech people see that, they see that they're having an impact um, in the business as a whole, and in your case, uh, individuals and how they live out their lives. That that would be a great motivator. That's so. Hats off to you for for doing that. That's a big deal. So, Paul, you talked a little bit earlier about um, AI, and you know, I know it's, it sounds like you've got some ideas about how you're going to use AI going down the road. What are some other ways that you see AI impacting uh, what you're doing, or even the broader? Uh, space and as far as respiratory space goes yeah it's uh it's huge because um ai for example can be built in to a patient management dashboard where right now we might have one respiratory therapist that can take care of 250 patients a month with ai built in they could see a thousand patients a month right if not more because ai will go in and will already do the readings for you if it's green don't don't look at the green you just focus on the yellow and the red right and so ai will will do the, the rest and then that person can only focus on things that, that's important um you know to focus on so that's one aspect of ai can be useful the other aspect would be when that respiratory therapist is in their home and they're monitoring that patient and they're calling that patient AI can help uh, train even that respiratory therapist to make sure, hey, when you talk to that patient, here are the five things you need to cover. And before you leave, make sure you cover these five things, right? So that's something that, that AI uh, can do. One of the things that I did, and I'm one of the patent holders, is um, in, in the real world, physicians have a very difficult time, especially when patients are 45 or 40 years and older, if they come in with similar symptoms, physicians have a very difficult time differentiating between asthma or COPD. And they're different drug components when you, when you diagnose them. And so um, I developed with a team, uh, both from experts in the field pulmonologists and respiratory experts, and a group of us at my previous pharmaceutical company, we developed um, an AI app. Within three to five minutes, we will diagnose asthma or COPD with greater accuracy than pulmonologists or primary care doctors. We've published this data. We've, uh, we use this data in, uh, we had a hundred cases. We, we did it in nine different countries. We had 360 physicians, 180 of them were pulmonologists and 180 of them were primary care doctors. We gave them over 70 parameters to look at to make the diagnosis. In other words, we don't omit anything. My device, which we call ACDC, don't get it confused with the rock band. Uh, it's called asthma, COPD, differentiation, classification, ACDC, within three to five minutes had higher accuracy than the doctors. So the primary care doctors, they were at 50% accurate. The pulmonologists, 61% accurate. 
My device, ACDC, 87% accurate. And that's with the version two. And so the, the, the beauty of that is, why is that important? In the U.S., it takes seven to eight doctor visits to get the diagnosis right. Uh, you have to go to the hospital or outsource to get these pulmonary function testing, which can cost anywhere from $1,500 to $2,000. And with our device, the doctor can do it in their office with three minutes. In three minutes, they're done. And they get an accurate diagnosis, which means... We can give you the right drug. I give you an example. My mother, when she was 80, was diagnosed with COPD. And they, they gave her one of our drugs that I actually was working on. It was a COPD drug. And my father goes, oh, your mother was diagnosed with COPD, and they gave her this product. You're working on that, right, Paul? I said, yeah, but I don't think mom has COPD. I think mom has asthma. And so I put her information in, in my AI device. And that AI device said, your mother has asthma. And so I took her to a specialist, worked on her for two hours, came up with the diagnosis of of asthma, and we gave her the proper treatment, and we saved her life. It took her a month to recover, but we saved her life. And a lot of people, this is an N of one, but this is what's happening all over the world. And so a lot of primary care doctors are waiting for this to be FDA approved with open arms because we can really make a huge difference in in making sure that number one, you have the right diagnosis because if you have the right diagnosis, I can give you the right drug and then we can help you with proper technique and adherence to keep you out of the hospital. So it's kind of like a nice package in the whole respiratory field that we've been we've been working on. And this is just the tip of the iceberg, really, of what AI is going to be doing. Well, that's that's exciting. Sounds like a you know a real good use case for AI, um, and you know impacting people's lives. So that's awesome. And getting the right diagnosis. Wow, that's uh, that's a big deal. It's kind of hard to believe that they're not able to do a better job of that today. Yeah, the symptoms are very similar, and it's not easy to to get that diagnosis uh we we put in 400,000 patients in the AI that's more patients than any physician in their lifetime will see right and so this AI is is very powerful and and can really do a good job and i always say to people when i give talks all over the world i say listen AI will not replace physicians but it will replace physicians without AI in other words if AI is available, that, that, that physician should have it because I would rather go to a physician that has an AI than one that doesn't because AI is always going to be superior to, uh, to the physician. And, and I, and let me add by that. Let me just add that garbage in is garbage out. Uh, good data in is good data out. Okay. You got to have good data. You got to test it. You got to validate it. Uh, and only then do you, do you imp- uh, um, uh, employ it and, and get it out there so you can benefit the patients and the physicians. Yeah, you're, so you're singing my song there. That's for sure. Um, yeah, you can't, so you cannot expect to get a good quality result without good quality data. I mean, you just can't. So whatever, you know, AI can only, well, AI learns from the data. And if your data is junk, then what your, the language model that's used for your AI is going to be junk too. And uh, there's just no way around that. I mean, you can, you can, uh, you, you can handle a few outliers here and there. You can account for that in your, in your models and so forth, but uh, the data quality has to be um, of, of high enough quality for you to get a good result. So, yeah, 100% agree with that. Um, what challenges do you see coming down the road um, that uh, that's going to impact your industry, your business, and 
if any, and how can technology be used to address that? Yeah, I, I think, like I said, um, you know, AI has been around since the 1950s. What hasn't been around is the data. Uh, we just didn't have the data that we what we have today. Now we're starting to grow and grow more data. Um, we we use one of the largest database in the world, the Optum database by by Humana, and uh, that Optum database. We wanted to look at different things, and one of them was what we call pheno um, uh, nitrous oxide, and we had very few patients that were on pheno. Now, a lot more starting to, to get the pheno testing. But we had so many little, we, we couldn't use it. We couldn't, we couldn't really develop what we wanted to develop. The AI was there saying, okay, give me data. And we didn't have the data to give it, right? So the challenge is continuing to get the right data to, to be able to, to grow and put it in these, uh, in these machines. Um, the other challenge is, because this is so early on, a lot of the physicians are very skeptical, you know, and, uh, and they still, oh, I don't know about this. Is this, you know, really going to, so there's some convincing on, on behalf of the physicians that you have to do. Uh, you have to provide them data to show the value of what you do. So we got to continuously do clinical trials and studies to, to prove what we, what we want to do. Uh, and then getting, uh, getting patients to adopt it right? Uh, not all patients are, are easy. And so what we want to do, the challenge would be is, how do we make a device that pretty much you don't have to do anything, right? We, we, we don't want you to, we want you to do very little. And that's where we talk about the evolving. You, you've all had the iPhones, right? The, and the I, iPods. You, when you open that case up, when I open the case up, all of a sudden, my phone says, "Oh, uh, I recognize there's an there's an uh, uh, ear pods on there, right? It recognize. I don't have to do anything. I just opened it up. Uh, it's kind of like that zero touch that we talked about. That's what I would like to introduce with our devices, right? So instead of having to pair them, why not just press one button and it's zero touch and they recognize who it is and makes it easier for patients. So I think the future is." We need to make it easier for patients where we're not bombarding them with too many devices, too many apps, too many things that they, they got to work with and just let, let them do what they need to do, take their medication, uh, and then we, we monitor them. So there will be some challenges there. We, we call, um, early adopters and late adopters, right? And so we we work with the early adopters, and then we try to help those uh, those late adopters, uh, and try to make it easy for them uh, as we monitor to them. And I think bringing that human element to the digital device is helping because nobody can talk to this, right? But they can talk to a live person on the other end if I need that. So the key is don't just give them a device. The, the giving somebody a device is not going to work. But you have to have a healthcare professional, somebody there that they can go to to ask questions, to to talk to them about their disease. To, and we found that is that's what the key is to working with. People still need um, humans involved. I mean, I, I don't like calling the telephone company, and it takes me ten minutes to get to a live person, if not a half hour, because because I'm talking to the AIs and I'm talking to this computer. And I'm like, I just want to talk to a live person, right? So we understand that. And we're not there in the future as we'd like to be. But I think introducing these devices, helping those patients, we've come a long way than, than, than where we're at. But it's important to have that human touch that's there that, that knows we're, we're there to help you. Because at the end of the day, we want to save your life. We want to help you breathe better so you can have a better life. Well said, well said. So um, any parting last uh, uh, points of advice that you might have for our audience as it relates to technology in the business? 
Yeah, I would say technology is here. It's not going away. It's just going to get better. Um, you know, a lot of people, I don't know if you know, remember the wars of, is it VHS or beta? You know, who's, who are we going to oh, go yeah. with? Right. And, uh, everybody's worried right. about that. Now, now we don't have either of them, right? We don't even have DVDs anymore. So, uh, you know, there's an evolution. This is where we're at. We're in this evolution of digital. Uh, I'm excited about it. I'm excited to see where this takes us, where the future goes. But it's not going to go away. It's just going to get more embedded and incorporated into our everyday lives where it's going to be so easy. You're, you're not even going to know what's happening to you. Um, and, and you know, from, from that standpoint, it, it shouldn't be we should just do digital to do digital. But we should have what is the unmet need? What can digital do to help you? What can digital do to improve what you couldn't do before? And so uh, if people are looking at that, you know, that, and that's how I started all this. It's like, well, what's the unmet need out there? Well, the unmet need is we have poor diagnosis. The unmet need out there is we have people that are dying uh, because they can't breathe. So you find these unmet needs, and it doesn't have to be in respiratory, whatever it is. What is the issue? And then you say, can we use technology to better that, to improve that? You don't say I have I, I I'm coming up with this technology, and then I'm going to say, well, let me give it to people to see if it. I I look at it the other way around. You 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 find an unmet need in society, and then you say, hey, can technology help better that and improve upon that? Yeah, we used to say uh, uh, when we see something someone had created, they like you said, they went for the technology first. Uh, often it looked like, you know, a solution looking for a problem. That's right. <laughs> that's right. And that's, it's really hard to find that right fit. There's not too many of those out there that uh, succeeded over time. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so uh, great advice about, you know, finding the need and then addressing that need and how technology can address it. So, um, Paul, I really appreciate you coming on and uh, giving us your time and sharing uh, some great information. It's a whole nother area that, uh, that I wasn't aware that was out there the, you know, the, with the devices that you have and so forth. So uh, I've learned a lot today. Is there, how can our audience uh, stay in touch with you, follow what you're doing and, uh, and, you know, hear about these advances that you all are implementing? Sure. Um, they can easily go to adherium.com. Uh, that's our, our website. Uh, they can follow me on LinkedIn. I'm always giving them, uh, giving people opportunities and, and, and uh, uh, letting people know what, what we're doing. So those are two good ways to, uh, to see what, uh, what's happening and where we're going. Awesome. Well, uh, if, and to our audience, if you have any questions or you want to get a hold of me for any reason, LinkedIn's a great place to do that for me as well. So reach out and uh, be happy to help you in any way we can. Uh, Everyone take care and we'll see you all next time.